Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, good to be with you here today on this Monday of the third week of Ordinary Time. And today is also the day of prayer for the legal protection of the unborn. Now, you know we have gone through all kinds of different things as far as uh, forcing this issue of abortion into the, into the states and all the drama that has been part of all of that. But we cannot, I, I think, just be thinking about... Um, the legal protection for the unborn, because that has been a failure in many ways. I want to share a couple thoughts with you, if I may, from this paper that I just kind of put together. Should abortion be legal or, un or illegal? And for some reason, that's where the con conversation starts, and that's where it ends. There's no nuance. There's no discussion of the series of tragedies that would lead up to someone making such a terrible decision. Tragedies of poverty, tragedies of, of the trauma that all this causes for so many women. We never hear about that, the dirty little secret of our uh, discussions about these things. The whole idea of calling um, abortion a reproductive right. What has happened in our culture that we could actually call such a thing that 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 destroys the most innocent, the most defenseless, and most vulnerable among us? We can have our discussions about when life begins, but for us, it begins at conception, and that will never change. That is an infallible teaching for all of us. And then, of course, talking about the child, the most defenseless, the most innocent, and the most vulnerable among us. Once abortion is made illegal, that's not when the mission is accomplished, as we now all know. That's when it just gets started. So we've had much trouble with that. We kind of stopped thinking that legalization is the issue. Secular legislation, this way or that way, isn't the magic bullet that suddenly fixes everything. One author writes, I mean, school shootings are illegal. Sexual abuse of minors is illegal. Human trafficking, violence, assault, these are all illegal. And no one in their right mind would say that, that they are not still a problem, a very much big problem in our culture. You see, we are not saved by the United States government. That's not where we are called to put our trust alone. As followers of Jesus, we are called to engage in a much deeper level. We're followers of Jesus, primarily, not the United States government. So let's you and I pray today for the protection, not just the legal, the protection of the unborn. And let's you and I be people of life in everything from, from conception to natural death. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let's ask God for his mercy as the unborn cry out for help. Lord Jesus, you call us to new life. Lord, have mercy. You call each of us to live full lives. Christ, have mercy. You are a God who loves all from conception to natural death. And even beyond, Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. And let us pray. God, our Creator, we give thanks to you who alone have the power to impart the breath of life as you form each of us in our mother's womb. Grant, we pray, that we whom you have made stewards of creation may remain faithful to that sacred trust and constant in lifeguarding the dignity of every single human life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. All the tribes of Israel 
came to David in Hebron and said, Here we are, your bone and your flesh in days past. When Saul was our king, it was you who led the children of Israel out and brought them back. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people of Israel and shall be commander of Israel. When all the elders of Israel came to David in Hebron, King David made an agreement with them there before the Lord, and they anointed him king of Israel. David was thirty years old when he became king and reigned for forty years, seven years and six months in Hebron over Judah, and thirty-three years in Jerusalem over all Israel and Judah. Then the king and his men set out for Jerusalem against the Jebusites, who inhabited the region. David was told, You cannot enter here. The blind and the lame will drive you away. Which was their way of saying, David cannot enter here. But David did take the stronghold of Zion, which is the city of David. David grew steadily more powerful, for the Lord of hosts was with him. The word of the Lord. I have found David, David, I have found David, my servant, I have found David, David, I have found David, my servant. Once you spoke in a vision, And to your faithful ones you said, On a champion I have placed a crown. Over the people I have set a youth. I have found I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil, I have anointed him, that my hand may be always with him, and that my arm may make him strong. I have found My faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and through my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand upon the sea, his right hand upon the rivers. I have found be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. The scribes who had come from Jerusalem said to Jesus, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he drives out demons. Crazy. Summoning them, he began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. If the house divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. That is the end of him. But no one can enter a strong man's house to plunder his property unless he first lies, ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. Amen. I say to you, all sins will, all sins and all blasphemies that people utter will be forgiven them. 
But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, but is guilty of the everlasting sin, where they had said he has an unclean spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So, let's you and I dig in this gospel here for a moment. Remember last week I, I said to all of you that Jesus, now in this part of his ministry, um, after uh, the astonishing things he does and comes to conflict with the Herodians and the Pharisees, and now he begins his process of, of creating his new family by, first of all, calling the Twelve. Then after that, in the scriptures, this context for all of us here, he comes home and the relatives say he is out of his mind. Here he is trying to create this new family, this new family of God, this new Israel, if you want to kind of put it that way. He goes back to his own uh, natural family and they say he's out of his mind. And, and uh, so he's rejected by his own biological family. And can we imagine the hurt of that? Can we imagine, here's Jesus doing what the Father wants him to do and doing all these things. And here are the people as closest to him who almost completely, totally reject him. It's, I, I mean, you and I cannot imagine the hurt that that would cause. Then we come to today's gospel where the heavy hitters are here. Now, the, from Jerusalem, uh, all around there, this is, this is the big wigs. And they're showing us, who is this young upstart that seems to be causing such a commotion and so they get around and they, they sit around with Jesus and, and um, they listen for a little bit, maybe just for a little bit, you know, and they say, oh, well, he's tied up with the devil. He, uh, uh, he is possessed by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. That's how he drives out demons. Really? Could you imagine the pain, the anguish? Here he is rejected by the chief priests, the elders, the, the brainiacs of Judaism. He's rejected by his own family as he tries to start his own family. Imagine those people following him. And then he goes on to talk to them. He talks about um, that's absolutely absurd. And it sounds like Jesus is completely under control, but I'm, I'm sure his heart's pretty heavy. Why would Satan drive out Satan? Then he talks about the everlasting sin. What is this unforgivable sin? I don't know. A picture, I just think that's a great picture. You know, what's this everlasting sin? What's this all about? And I asked Logan to put this up for you guys so you guys could see this as I go through this. Since we're studying the catechism, and follow your faith. I thought maybe I could uh, talk about this with the catechism here today. I'm in paragraph 1864, and it says this. And by the way, this is a quote by Pope John Paul. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of the eternal sin. Um, so, so that's a quote from Scripture. Too. What is that? We were just getting things set up, and I threw something up there to, to show this picture here. And, and Logan even said to me, well, what is that? What is, this, what is this sin that God can't forgive? And uh, it goes on like this. There are no limits to the mercy of God, but anyone who deliberately refuses to accept his mercy by repenting rejects the forgiveness of his sins and the salvation offered by the Holy Spirit. There you have it, folks. No limits to God's mercy. But anyone who deliberately refuses to accept his mercy by repenting. In other words, I, I've had people say this to me. I, God can't forgive my sins. I'm, I'm just too bad. I, God can't. I said, what? God can't forgive your sins? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? I, I don't know that I convinced anybody about that. If you really think that God can't forgive your sins and you don't let him, how can he? You have to repent. you got to be like this sometimes, all of us. Remember, I, I said to you on New Year's Day, one of the great commandments or the great, the great prayers, I'm sorry, is help, help, help. Help me, Lord. And our, God forgives all sins when we allow him. Why do we drag around these sins all over the place? And, and continue to be burdened by all these sins where, where we could be set free in a moment. So, but anyone who deliberately refuses to accept his mercy by repenting rejects the forgiveness of his sins and the salvation offered by the Holy Spirit. I'm almost afraid to share with you the last sentence because it says this, such hardness of heart, hardness of heart, can lead to final impenitence and eternal loss. Isn't that the most tragic thing? When heaven... The glory of heaven is right before our very eyes. No limits to God's mercy. You just heard that. Um, but are we open to the gift? 
of God's mercy. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as the, the gospel refrain is over and over and over again sometimes. Here's my question for today. Are you feeling more and more each day that you are a member of God's family? Even though Jesus is rejected by his family, and even though he's, he's told he's called Satan in many ways, are you allowing this Jesus to lead you? Do you feel like you're part of his family? Thanks for joining me today on this day of prayer for the unborn. Let's continue to do that today. And thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye now.